Welcome to the Deep End by On Deck, a podcast for visionary builders, creators, and thinkers to discuss world changing stories and ideas. I'm your host, Marshall Kozlov. We should be able to push a button and get a part. There should be a factory in a box, essentially, that people have access to because the applications that it can push forward are just immense. I mean, we we mentioned medical, aerospace, automotive. I don't think people realize quite how much the future is going to be 3D printed. The sad reality though, is that it's just not where it needs to be. On Deck is where ambitious people worldwide go to start companies, find their next roles, and invest in their careers. The Deep End invites the founders, operators, and investors from the On Deck community and beyond to turn their experiences into the ideas others need to start their own odysseys. Joining me this week in the Deep End is Rob Paddock, co-founder and CEO of A Headwind. A Headwind was one of the first companies admitted into ODX and is currently building technology that reduces human involvement in the 3D printing process. Today's conversation is about the future of 3D printing automation. Rob outlines how the general public is usually under the assumption that 3D printing is as simple as a push button process. He underscores how it isn't actually that simple in most commercial use cases. Human involvement is often needed to calibrate printer settings. We discuss how 3D printers need their own kind of operating system in the same ways that personal computers do. Rob brings great examples to the table for us to digest. Our conversation spans 3D applications for wind turbines, rocket ships, and much more. For more information about how Rob and his team are building, visit aheadwind.com or follow Rob on Twitter at paddock underscore Rob. Rob Paddock, welcome to The Deep End. Thank you. Glad to be here. Glad you're here too. It's funny. Sometimes you can tell exactly what a company is by its name, but as a generalist, I have no idea what a headwind means in this context. So can you explain what that name means and how it relates to your actual business? Yeah. Um, initially, a headwind came from the idea of us uh, 3D printing entire wind turbines. Um, it was only as we got into the actual production of these wind turbines that we realized that 3D printing is just not mature enough to actually work for production. Um, so now we're, we're building software and sensors, so, that, so the name just kind of stuck. Um, but we are not no longer just focused on the wind industry. That's fascinating. Let's actually start with discussing the 3D printing space. This is yeah. a space which anyone in tech has heard talk about 3D printing for a long time. And you just pointed out when you started, this wasn't as mature as you thought it was. Let's start with, before you started the company, what was your assessment of the of the 3D printing space? Yeah, uh, there was a lot of hype about 3D printing. Um, and this was now years ago. But overall, the assessment was, it works. Um, I think a lot of the general public is still under the assumption that it is a push button process. Um, so you can upload a part, push a button and actually get the part. Uh, well, now we've 3d printed and sold over $150,000 worth of parts to, to hospitals, enterprises, government programs. Uh, I can tell you definitely that is, uh, that is not the case. Um, and so it was really frustrating because we ran into a lot of issues trying to print parts that had to be accurate, had to be consistent. Um, and we just, we just couldn't do it. Uh, it was, it was a huge struggle. Let's, uh, talk about why, why, why is that? Like, why isn't it just, um, push button? Yeah. So contrary to popular belief, there's a lot of human involvement. Uh, and for each part that you print, uh, a human actually has to go in and, and toggle all the printer settings in order to get it tuned and calibrated. And humans end up making a lot of error. Um, and so what ends up happening is the instructions that are sent to the printer uh, are never the best instructions. Um, and it results in, in failed prints, um, having to do reprints, really frustrating things like that. 
Okay, that's really interesting because as you kind of pointed out, there's the public perception. My public perception is there's a device, there's a box, you upload something, you press a button, it prints. That's the that's the printer metaphor. Yeah, yeah. But when you're talking about the human addition there, what's the what's the balance you think between the human interaction and the actual 3D printing? Uh, we think there should be no human interaction. Um, we believe strongly that 3D printing should be completely data driven and automated. Uh, that is not how it works today. Um, and what you see is these these PhDs, these industry experts who have been around forever. Uh, they can they can bend these 3D printers to their will and come out with incredible parts. But for the 99% <laughs> of the population, they cannot do that. Um, and so it just ends up in, in disappointment. I'd love you to actually talk about those PhDs then. So I guess what you're getting at is if we think of the public demonstrations of look at what this person produced or did in this, this or that way, that yeah. is not obviously anywhere near to the average idealized user of this type of technology. So just talk about the work that the PA, talk about what that top 1% is doing in the space. Yeah. Um, I think there's a little bit of a availability bias, right? Um, everyone who can 3d print is uh, posting about it, talking about it. They're qualified to, to teach others about it. Um, and so that's really all you see is this this sort of 1%-ish who is, um, again, bending these printers to their will and producing incredible parts. Um, but again, that is just not not the way it works for everyone else. Man, I'd love for you to talk about this idea of bending to will because as I just look at my MacBook right now, I'm just yeah. realizing that everything is just push button. I, I like – I've never – it seems obvious, but I've never heard that word, but I press leave studio, we leave studio. I turn up the mic, we turn up the mic. What's it just yeah. like to engage in a technology space where it just actually isn't that intuitive? You can imagine trying to use a, a PC without an operating system. Um, that's sort of how it is to use 3D printers. Um, that's, that's the best analogy. Help me through that analogy because I don't know. I'm not going to ask your age, but I was born in 1992, so I literally cannot comprehend a computer without an operating system. So just explain what you mean by that metaphor. Yeah, essentially, uh, you can't use a computer unless you know how to code um, and and actually program it yourself. Um, before this, before this software layer that is the operating system, that that sort of took the the computer and and put over this layer of abstraction. Um, so that people can go in and have everything be push button. Uh, well, before that, you needed to know how to program, to code, to actually create these uh, systems on the computer by yourself. Um, and today, 3D printers don't have that that operating system layer that they need. So to stick with the operating system metaphor, something Bill Gates would obviously talk about at the dawn of the personal computer is you would have a personal computer in in every home is the world that you're building towards a world where there's a 3d printer in every factory in every garage like how do you think about the world you're trying to build here if you're arguing we don't have the operating system yet yeah i'm not one to push the narrative of we're going to have one in every home um that's going to be very far in the future at least what i do believe though is that every business that operates in the world of atoms um is going to have a 3d printer uh, and the reason for that is because you can make parts that with 3D printing that just aren't possible with traditional manufacturing. And talk about, so give me an example. Like what's something that you can't do um, unless it's 3D printed? Yeah. Um, we can look at like electric vehicles as an example. If you're trying to lightweight a part, so let's say you want, you have an electric vehicle uh, and you're trying to extend its range you want to make the car as light as possible, right? Only 3D printing is going to give you the ability to design parts with total freedom. Um, it doesn't compromise you in the actual designs that you can make. Um, and so instead of, it, it's a little tough to explain. Um, there are certain limitations to with traditional manufacturing in the actual geometries that you can make. Um, and so it's never the the perfect optimization of, of strength to weight, for, for an example. Um, but with 3D printing, you don't have those constraints. And so you are able to make a, a piece completely optimized where the material is only where it needs to be 
to hit certain strength uh, and weight specifications. Does that make sense? And you yeah, know it, it it does. And I don't want to spend too much time on the company <clears throat> company pre pivot, but I'm just curious. Why did you start with wind turbines specifically? Yeah, uh, we saw a huge opportunity to actually lower the levelized cost of wind energy. Um, essentially, the idea was to lower sort of the, the capex of, of wind turbines by 3D printing wind turbines. Um, and funny enough, we actually ended up working with uh, the largest wind blade manufacturer in the U.S. Um, and we're part of some research that actually is pr- really promising and driving down the cost of wind energy. Um but the, the idea that we were able to 3D print uh, an entire wind turbine uh, just wasn't possible with the, the technology that existed a couple years ago. And do you think it's true that the impossibility factor there is going to move across categories? So not merely just a wind turbine, but also other types of, let's just say, promising areas where, where it comes to lowering costs. Would you say that's true? Absolutely. Um, you see it everywhere from like rockets and cars to like these dental companies who, you know, uh, I won't name names, but people who are are creating these aligners and retainers and, uh, you know, whitening solutions. uh, These businesses are all powered by 3D printing. Um, And so I think we're going to see it across industries. Absolutely. I don't expect you to name names, but you said name names as if that'd be a bad thing. I'm just curious what you meant by that. Um. So people don't love to brag about uh, what they can't do. Uh, and so let's, there's some, some big dental companies, uh, their startups, venture backed that are doing these retainers, um, you know, personalized mass customization, right? Right now they 3D print the molds for every retainer. Um, this, this mass customization would not be possible without 3D printing. The next step past that is just 3D printing the retainer itself. Um, But again, that's not possible because of the accuracy and consistency issues. So that's just one example. Yeah. So now we're, we're pre we're, we're post pivot. How, what are you doing now then? So like, like you said, you know, you, you, you're, you're helping like with specific parts, 150 K was the number, was the number listed there. Just like help us understand the difference between what you're doing now. Yeah. Uh, so before we were we were 3D printing and selling parts, um, and we did a lot of it. <laughs> um, and then we sort of set out to well solve our own problem, and now we're building software and sensors um, that essentially can attach pretty quickly onto any professional printing system, um, and it basically acts as the eyes and ears for the operator, uh, automating away a lot of the the error prone and human driven processes that we rely on today. Can you help me understand, because you're doing a great job of explaining the technical side seriously, help me understand what it looks like to have human prone error parts of this. So I'm imagining tinkering yeah. <laughs> the, the nozzle to the wrong level. And I don't think that's quite what it is. So like, what do you, so help me understand like what the human no, error exactly looks like. Um, that's exactly what it is. Oh, really? That's that it's, it's that straightforward. It's that straightforward. <laughs> um, so yeah, things like, um, toggling where the nozzle is it's so rudimentary but it does exist um toggling temperature i mean to give you an idea the the sort of current software that's used to basically upload your 3d part file and then convert that into instructions that the printer can understand um, that software requires the user to input sometimes up to 200 settings um, wow. like 200 different settings. So you can imagine, um, the, the experts, the PhDs, they know all of them, right? They can, they can go in there and, and toggle everything and bend the printer to their will. 99% of people do not. And they sort of get overwhelmed and frustrated. Uh, and it ends up just in, in failed prints mostly. So can you talk around, so when you, when you speak with clients, right? Mm-hmm. When you're speaking of clients, you're serving them. Are these folks who knew that the technology has difficulties and requires work? Or are these Ooh. people who bought their 3D printer and they're shocked that it isn't quite up to the standard they're looking for? What's the psychographic here? Yeah. So there's a few points on that. Uh, sadly, it happens more often than not when people 
purchase a new machine, let's say it's a $70,000 machine. We just had this happen with one of our customers. They get it. They're immediately on a project deadline for a customer and they cannot get their project out uh, because they're just fighting with the machine. Um, And so the sort of false promise that 3D printing is a push button process uh, has has victims (laughs) um, who have adopted it, um, not not blindly, um, but not with all of the maybe the information that they might wanted to uh, to have. Um, I, I would also make sort of uh, another distinction for companies who are looking to adopt 3D printing. They normally fall into two groups. So the first group knows about the accuracy and consistency issues. And group one, this, this group that knows about these issues, has a plan to basically overcompensate by hiring internal experts, setting up different mm-hmm. processes, um, and really just setting up systems to overcompensate for the fact that 3D printers are, are not accurate and consistent. Uh, so this could mean, you know, post-processing work, I'm going to have to sand down a part or, or finish a part because it's not perfect. Uh, it's really expensive <laughs> uh, to do this. And this is the, the minority of companies. Um, a great example that I, I will name names is Relativity Space. They did a great job at this. Uh, they're 3D printing rockets, um, but they had to develop sort of homegrown systems, you know, sensors mm-hmm. uh, to actually make that work. Group two, <laughs> uh, which is group- which is which is what which is what you're doing across categories, correct? Yeah. Um, well, we're we're building the solution for the next relativity space. Um, okay, so the next great. the next relativity space isn't gonna have two years to spend building out internal systems. Um, they can just use a headwind. Perfect. Yeah. But what's the second group? So the second group is again, the majority of people, they learn about the, the accuracy and consistency issues. Uh, and it's a pretty much full stop, um, to them, the, the accuracy and consistency problems disqualify 3d printing from being viable for their business. They don't have the extra capital to, to go and recruit internal experts and build out these systems. They just disqualify it. It's not, the technology isn't ready. Um, we want to present a third option <laughs> where you can just get a printer and it just works. So you don't have to go out and hire these internal experts um, to, to overcompensate and you can actually adopt the, the technology. That's, that's the whole idea. I, I really like the vision part of we want to build or help the, the next relativity space. So can we start by actually just like spend a, spend a little time explaining like what it is that they are doing and then talk a little expansively around what different categories that your company could fuel. What would those look like? Or what are you excited about? Yeah. So just looking at rockets. Uh, so what they're doing is they're 3D printing rockets. Um, and in aerospace, instead of a you know traditional rocket, having thousands of parts, because they're 3D printing, um, they can actually bring that number way down to hundreds of parts. Um, And in aerospace, that's really important because each part goes through like 10 different hands um, and it Mm -hmm. gets really expensive uh, just because it's aerospace. Um, But they are, they're trying to drive down the cost of um, getting to orbit and, and beyond. Um, and they're using 3d printing to do it. So, uh, that, that's a really good sort of case example of someone who's, you know, overcompensated in a lot of areas and is making it work in terms of the other places, um, the other industries, could you just uh, sort of clarify on that, that piece a bit? Yeah. I want to, let me ask a quick follow-up question here yeah. on the relative space point. So as you said, they compensated, but you said most companies can't do that. Um, two levels. Is, is, is that an issue of timing? Because you said it took two years to do it. Is it a question of time and is it a question then of money? So it's capital intensive to over... Like help us understand that part of it. Yeah, time and money. That's it. Um, these, these systems take a long time to build out um, and they require a lot of upfront capital, um, which most people just don't have to expend. Yeah, and then the second part of the question was if the goal then is to build the sensors and and the tooling capabilities that can enable relativity spaces in different categories, what are some categories that 
either you're working with now and is that like out in the open or are that you're excited about? Yeah. So uh, aerospace and, and past just rockets is a huge one. Um, the automotive industry. Um, so we've been invited to, to sort of pitch at some of the, the larger uh, OEMs in the, in the automotive space. Um, What's an OEM? With, um, so like a Ford, Toyota, Honda, uh, sort of, you know, those types of companies. Mm-hmm. Um, they're the ones who, yeah, make the cars. That's really all it means. Um, besides that, the medical industry is extremely exciting. You look at something like hip implants today, and most people don't know that 90% of hip implants today are already 3D printed. Um, so if you're getting a hip implant, it's going to be printed, <laughs> um, and you want it, it's kind of scary. You want it to be accurate. We've, I've heard horror stories on that. Um, so yeah, the medical industry is, is really exciting. Uh, aerospace automotive. Um, and I think there's a, there's a few companies that are coming out in the construction space too, uh, starting to 3d print homes. And so it's, it's really interesting to see, see what's happening, um, with home construction in particular, we'll, we'll see where that goes, but it, it looks really promising. Horror stories aside, I'm interested <laughs> in, actually, no, let's not push the horror stories aside. Once again, no need to name names, but like what, what actually does it look like when you're 3d printed, um, like bone body part, et cetera, is, is screwed up. Like how does, how has that worked? Multiple surgeries. That's the horror story I'm referring to. Uh, where someone has gotten an implant and they've had to, you know, have multiple surgeries to, to remove it and then basically, you know, try again because um, the, the part is not uh, behaving as it should uh, once it's actually inside the, the person's body. Yeah, but yeah. it's the, and that's the wild part. I think that what, what's interesting though in talking about that category, what's moved to the positive is just the 90% adoption in that space like what what has what has driven that high adoption rate because given the way we started the conversation it's been oh it's like all this hype and isn't where it is yet 90 percent that's more of an hype so what drove that yeah well it comes down to the simple fact that every person is different so every person needs a different hip implant and uh it would cost a lot of money to you know have the tooling and using traditional manufacturing to, to produce one-offs every time. Um, but in 3D printing, you know, the saying is that complexity is free. It's supposed to be. Um, and so you can actually do these one-offs extremely effectively. Um, that's why, you know, spaces like uh, hip implants or uh, retainers, you know, they each have to be different. And that's where 3D printing shines. So I had a non-3D printed retainer, at least I assume it was. This is 2008, Marshall speaking. And I have not had to have a hip plant. Um, that's also the whole born in the 90s thing, which is useful. What did that space look like before 3D printing? So were, were there just like generics that had to be molded? Like, do you, do you have any idea what that looked like? Um, I actually don't. Um, I actually do not. I, I imagine it was, again, a more uh, a process driven more by uh, manual processes um, or manual methods. Um, but I, I can't sort of uh, speak uh, to, to what it was before. Yeah, it seems to me, um, as I'm thinking about this, and then, then I want to get into your interest in like origin story in the field, but it seems yeah. to me, a dy- not a dilemma, but a dynamic I'm curious about is when, when you're looking at industries where 3D printing can reach those high rates of adoption and you're getting success, how... Are these big businesses? Are these big medical systems? Is it a parts garage around the corner? Like what scale of either funding or just overall like investment tends to be best suited for the industry and your company today? So if you, um, if I understand your question correctly, uh, these are, these are large companies that are pushing to adopt it like your apples, um, or let's say that the production of the iPhone, like the, these are um, on the, the largest scale of companies trying to to adopt and push forward the, the 3D printing technology. Great. Yeah, I know that, that did answer the question. So let's, let's just go to your interest in this field broadly. 
yeah. um, that sustained you through a couple of different pivots there, obviously. So yeah, just what's your, yeah. what's your, what's your origin story? What, what attracted you to the space? Yeah. Well, I initially studied finance and economics at the university of Denver. Um, and then I actually dropped out to start headwind, um, with the idea of 3d printing wind turbines. Um, the, the fascination with the space, um, I, I learned about 3d printing, uh, seven years ago, um, when I was sort of teaching myself how to code, how to, um, you know, design 3d parts in, in, you know, CAD programs, um, and assemble 3d printers. The, the fascination to me was that we should be able to push a button and get a part. Um, there should be a factory in a box essentially that people have access to because the applications that it can push forward are just immense. I mean, we, we mentioned medical aerospace automotive. Um, I don't think people realize quite how much the future is going to be 3d printed. Uh, the, the sad reality though, is that it's just not where it needs to be. Um, for that future to to actually exist. Um, and so this sort of idea of, you know, having a computer file of a part and being able to put it into a, a, a box and have the, the material put in the perfect place every time so that you can open that door and, and have whatever part it is. Um, for all the Star Trek fans uh, who might listen to this, I don't know if Marshall, if you're a Star yeah, Trek fan. Yeah, re rep re replicators. The obviously. replicator. Um, that was also like sort of that that image of the future um, really stuck out to me, um, and I think it's a feature that we should have, and it's just not the case right now. So, and that's what's interesting here because. The key thing is, once again, for the, for the non-Star Trek fans, think of a replicator as akin to a microwave. So you press um, chicken and then chicken appears through, you know, inanimate matter and all those things. It's not like yeah. literally a chicken. Um, but when it comes to 3D printing, I think this is just where the tension is. And like, I appreciate how realistic you're being on this at a consumer level. So let's put aside like the industrial scale things. Yeah. I've seen like I have a, like my my partner's younger brother. He three D prints like little like figurines. Like what what's what what does the industry look like at that level? Because he's not a I wouldn't describe him as an uber expert. He's just like a junior in college. Like how how do you think about the consumer space? The consumer space is. I will say this: last year there's over a million like desktop printers sold. Um, I have one sitting right here. <laughs> um, they're really great. How big, how, how, how big is it? Um, just like this. <laughs> yeah. For, for uh, audio listeners, it's it, not, it's, 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 it's big, few, but it's not over. It's, it's like not overwhelmingly big. Foot and a half by foot and a half. Yeah. Um, they're really great for prototyping. And if you know what you're doing, you can actually create, uh, really valuable parts using, you know, cheap machines. One example of this is, uh, during the pandemic, we printed and delivered face shields to hospitals, and we used desktop printers to do that. Oh, cool! Yeah, and that was and that was uh, and that I mean, I want to say like that worked as if the pandemic was solved, but like yeah. how like how how was that ex how was that experience? Uh, it was good. Um, we we essentially raised money from uh, people to pay for materials. Um, that we could print with. And then I was personally delivering these, these face shields in boxes to hospitals, uh, in the Denver area. So, yeah, no, like that's, I think that's, that's an example of that side. Um, I don't know, I don't know how deep you are in your computer history, but, um, if you're looking at that seventies, late sixties era, it's really just like the hobbyist era. So the people who are most engaged are, are, are the hobbyists. Is, is it, mm -hmm. is it useful to think of, those million printers that were sold, these are just the hobbyists and that the state of the industry right now is there are the, and once again, because computers were doing huge things in the sixties and seventies. But once again, that wouldn't claim that there wasn't 15, 20 years of work to be done. So yeah. is that an accurate understanding of like where the space is? Cause that's my takeaway from your conversation. I think it is. Um, and uh, I can't, you know, make, you know, these sweeping generalizations. Um, but for the most part, uh, the hobbyists, that's, that is where they exist in this sort of consumer market. Um, that being said, 
again, there are people out there, uh, the minority people, who are using these lower end machines to create high end products, but that is not the the majority. So I'd love to, because then we're going to get to ODX um, stuff to yeah. wrap. I'd, I'd love to. You're being very, very good. <laughs> this is you being a good founder. Um, not my favorite guest. I'm kidding. You're a great guest. <laughs> In that you're, you're. I, I'm guessing I'm not going to get an exact prediction of the timeline here from you. Um, so I'm not asking yet because once again, you're not here for thought leadership. You're here just as someone's building in the space. But can you just give me your general sense of how, let's say with B plus confidence, you could see the next five, six, seven years going, especially in the sense that when you would speak to an investor about this space? Yeah. So the next six, seven years, I think we'll see a... a Take up in the adoption of 3D printing um, because we're going we are going to be trending toward um, this sort of zero effort uh, onboarding process where people can actually get a machine delivered, um, press press their button which says print, and then get a part. Um, and especially as we start to work with OEMs directly um, and sort of one by one go through the market and um, put our systems onto these machines. We do think there's going to be a huge tick up and there's actually a fascinating statistic on this. So 3d printing today is, is a $15 billion market. Um, but it represents point or less than 0.1% of total manufacturing, um, which is massive, right? There's reason to believe we're going to get to 5% of total manufacturing. Uh, at which point the 3D printing industry is going to go from the $15 billion industry that it is today to the $615 billion industry. Um, and that has a timeline of, I would say, 10 to 12 years. Um, so, so that's what I can, I can say in terms of sort of the, the near term or medium term future, depending on how you look at it. Yeah, it's interesting. As you were saying that, I immediately thought of, you'll know 3D printing has succeeded when people just stop breaking it out as a separate category. When this is, people just think of manufacturing and manufacturing has 3D printing driven aspects. So actually that's actually a useful way to, a question to ask you then. Yeah. How useful is it to think of these as separate industries, separate processes? Is, is this really gonna be about like mixing and matching and there's always gonna be a role for a human there? Like, how do you think about that dynamic? I think humans have a tendency to to cling on to labels. So like we see what's happening in Web3, it's like Web3, 3D printing is, is not just manufacturing, it's additive manufacturing. Um, it's going to be widespread and widely adopted when it, it's boring and no one's talking about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for the purpose of uh, the industry being able to identify itself and, and push the narrative, I think, you know, it, it does need to stay separate, but ultimately the, the end goal is that it is just synonymous with manufacturing um, and serial manufacturing, uh, not, not just sort of prototyping, which, which 3D printing is, is currently tethered to <laughs> as a technology. And for the uh, second to last question here, yeah. you referred to the building, you know, you're, you're building in the world of atoms, obviously. Can you just talk about, because most, most of our episodes are focused on obviously like the, the bits side of things. I, I'm personally really yeah. drawn to areas focused on Adam. So just talk about being a founder in that space and how, you know, it, it compares and contrasts to what you've seen from other founders and who are thinking about different problems. So it's weird because we're, we're a software company, <laughs> but our software controls 3D printers and 3D printers, you know, control atoms, uh, essentially. Um, we're seeing hardware get uh, less hard. So there's this always uh, this um, old adage, you know, hardware is hard. We're seeing that go away a little bit. Supply chain issues that are currently uh, still, you know, trudging along don't, don't help that narrative. Um, but we're seeing it get better. And ultimately, that is what we want to push forward. We want everyone to be able to have access to creating atoms, creating hardware. Um, and 3D printing is the best way to do that. Um, and there's this sort of bottleneck, this, this barrier 
uh, that that's 3D printing's lack of accuracy and consistency uh, that's sort of holding it back that we want to try and sort of peel peel off. And uh, I lied my second to last because you just made me think of a follow up, which I now have. Yeah. Oh no, which I now have forgotten. We're gonna have to edit this out. That's all right. Um, shoot, I actually was super, super, super. Oh yeah, here's here here's the Phil. This is where we should come back into the episode. Here's the question: Before you moved on from wind turbines, what did your vision for the company look like? I'm imagining just like a big warehouse with a big 3d printer but it seems like you're recording this from like a home or something like that are you are are you now that you're focused more on the software side of things are you just like entirely remote like what's been the difference difference during like the COVID era yeah so sort of few parts to that question um the the vision pre-pivot was actually being able to print these wind turbines on site um Oh, cool. Wind energy gets cheaper. I see why you got excited about that. That's a, that's a very yeah. cool sound. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so th- um, wind energy actually gets cheaper when you have essentially larger wind turbines um, because of the, the power law. But you today, you can't have larger wind turbines because of bridges. That's actually the, the limiting factor. Um, you can only so transport so much in a, in a, a really big, helpful yeah. way. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's like, if your bridge is like 12 feet, it's like, that's, that's your max if you need to transport something. Um, and so we were going to 3d print these wind turbines on site, um, and then assemble them and, and erect them, you know, right there. Uh, now since we're focused on software, um, yeah, I'm in my house right now. We have a office in downtown Denver, um, and we're actually starting to to now hire and grow out our engineering team. And we are not discriminating against anyone remote. Um, although we are, if there is talent, let's say that's in another uh, country <laughs> or state, um, we don't want to compromise, and so we will bring that person on remote. Um, but we are not going to actively try to rec- recruit um, remote employees just because. Um, and so we're, we're finding the balance right now. Um, and I- I'm sure we're going to learn a lot uh, over just the next couple of hires. So to wrap, you know, you're part yeah. of Ondex ODX program. We'd love for you just to talk about like, your experience in the program. And also like, once again, like this, this podcast goes out to the Ondex community. So, you know, you said, you know, you're, you're hiring, you know, you have people, you know, you have, you have, you're, you're growing. Congratulations, obviously very yeah, important you. and not awkward if it's doing a podcast halfway <laughs> through. Um, it hasn't happened, but it, 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 it will happen at some point. Um, so yeah, if we're just ODX experience, but also like, what are some things you'd like to shout out to the on deck community that could be of interest, relevance, partnerships, employees, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so I'll hit those sort of in reverse, um, for, for all the engineers in the on deck community. I mean, we are just looking for world-class talent and exceptional ability. Uh, and then also someone who actually fits in our, our values and our culture, um, that we have, uh, th- those those two pieces are really important, and not necessarily in that order. Um, so, if you if you are interested in sort of creating the, the future of manufacturing for everyone listening, uh, please do reach out because uh, we're hiring. <laughs> We'd love to hear from you. Um, and remind me y- your first question again, Marcia? Yeah, just how's 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 your ODX experience been? And uh, you know, just like your great. I have no nothing bad to say about the ODX experience. Um, I actually, this started out from a cold email to our our build advisor um, before ODX was officially launched. (laughs) And so we were one of the the first couple companies to actually get in and it has been nothing short of exceptional. Um, The, the caliber of people and other founders is super impressive. The, the help that we are receiving from our, our build advisors and our team, it's in all the right areas. And so they let us sort of, they step back and let us build our company, but there's also assistance where we need it. Um, and not just this flipping, you know, hey, I'm here to help. It's, I can I can introduce you to, to customers, to other investors, um, and really push a headwind forward uh, in a meaningful way. And so uh, we're, we're wrapping up sort of the three months of the program. And again, I have just nothing um, but great things to say. 
I do have to ask you this. What is, because I, I really like the name of Headwind, but like you said, you're not in turbo. Is that like, how yeah. do you explain it to a new customer? Yeah. Um, they rarely ask. <laughs> okay. That's the, that's the secret. Yeah. They, they don't ask. Um, and I've heard other people like the name. Um, and so we're, we're, we're sticking with it. Yeah. But <laughs> it's so, yeah, that's such a, I, I like your answer there because they just don't ask. Like if I were, so if, once again, there's a reason why you're a founder, I'm a podcaster. But if I were <laughs> a podcaster, a professional editorial person, I'd be like, no, like the metaphor, then we have to find a new one because yeah. what's going to happen with the search? But you're just like, yeah, like it's, it, 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 it's a name. It's a good name. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I don't know. That's that. It's it's really cool. Like I really enjoy my job because I get to talk with people like you who just like are looking at the world and they're from a totally different perspective on that. Um, and it's just very. I don't know. It's actually just helpful to. I think everyone could take the advice of hey, like sometimes like if something's good and something works, something works, uh, and that's important. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Good show, well, Rob. This has been really fun. Uh, thank you for joining us on the deep. Yeah, Marshall, it's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me.